So the other way to affect a force is to use a mask. And let's just demonstrate how that works. I lay down a mask field. And I connect that through to the data connector of my force. And this can coexist quite happily with the noise. But in fact, for the purpose of this example, I'm going to delete our noise node. And a mask field needs, on its second input here, a field of some kind. Now this can be a field that's already being calculated, for example as part of a smoke simulation, or it can be a field that is created independently in SOPs in the form of a volume. And that's what we're going to do here. So I'm going to go up to SOP level. I'm going to lay down a sphere. I'm going to rename this mask volume and I'm going to dive inside and I'm going to increase the radius of our sphere and then I'm going to append an ISO offset and an ISO offset as you recall is a way of converting a normal piece of geometry into a fog volume and I'm going to give it 30 divisions so that it's a little bit more detailed and then let's, for good measure, append a null. And we'll call this volume out. We need now to bring this into our auto.network. And I can do that using a SOP scalar field node. Now, it's a scalar field because it only contains a single value. And it's a SOP scalar field because we're going to import it from SOPs. Now, rather than try and set up a container here for my field, which is exactly the same dimensions as the one we've created in SOPs, I could just select Use SOP Dimensions. And that will ensure that the volume dimensions that were created in SOPs are just going to be imported here into the scalar field. I then need to set the SOP path, which is going to be the mask volume, volume out null that we created. And I've connected this through to the mask. What I'm going to do is turn off the display of this mask volume and I'm going to lay down a visualization node, a scalar field visualization. This enables me to visualize my scalar field. If I select Show Guide Geometry and I select Use Smoke, what should happen is when I when this is finished calculating, we get to see a sphere again. And what a mask does is multiply the value of the force applied in our mask by the value of the mask. So in other words, because a fog volume has a value of 1 inside the, 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 the object here and a value of 0 outside, what we should see is a force applied to the objects which are inside this mask, this sphere, and a force of 0 applied outside. So let's revert this back to a value of 100 pointing upwards and see what happens. What we should see is, and we do see it, that the objects inside the mask are being given a force where the objects outside the mask are not having any force applied. And let me just turn off the display of the geometry so that we can uh, the visualization of the field rather so that we can see this happening and we can see quite clearly that the objects inside the field are having the force applied to them and they continue to move upwards because there's nothing dragging them back i'm going to add a drag force here in order to stop them as soon as they leave the sphere and i'm going to give it a value of 10. Let's see whether that now... What we should see is that these have a force applied to them. And then as they get up above that force, they gradually slow down 
and eventually come to a stop. And that's because outside of our sphere, they no longer have the uniform force applied to them. So they travel up, and then once they get outside the sphere, they start to slow down, as we can see. And we can increase the size of the drag force, and that should make this even more dramatic. And what we should see is that as they reach the edge of this sphere, the drag force slows them down to nothing, and we can see there that as soon as they're reaching the edge of that sphere, they're in fact coming to a halt. Let's try a slightly more complicated example with a mask. And for this, I'm going to lay down a ground plane using the shelf tool. And I'm going to move it down a little bit so that it's below our existing objects just a bit. Like so. And the next thing I'm going to do is include some gravity in our scene. And what I want to do now is to animate our volume that's creating our mask. So let's visualize that again. And I'm going to turn off simulation while I animate this. So I can do that using this button down here. And at frame one, what I want is our mask to be... Let's make sure we have the right thing selected. Is for our mask to be over this side of our scene. So if I Alt left click here, that will keyframe those parameters. And then at frame 100, say, I want it to be on this side of our scene. And again, Alt left click to keyframe those parameters. So what happens now is that this will move across our scene from frame 1 to 100. And what we want to do is bring this into DOPS. Well, you might think that all we need to do to bring this successfully into DOPS is to update the time parameter here. And this records the time at which our SOP uh, volume is going to be evaluated. So if I was to put in here $ST and set this to set always, you might think that what will happen and let me just uh, turn off our mask volume again. What you might think is what will happen is that this will be being updated at every frame, and it would help if I enabled simulation again, which I can do using this button. And what we can see, in fact, happens is that this just stays where it is. It's not moving. And the reason for that is that we also need to set the SOP path to set always. And that's because Houdini makes a number of assumptions about what is constant in DOPS. And it assumes not only that when we have this to uh, use default, default is set, as you recall, to set initial. What it does is assume that not only does the value of this parameter, the SOP path, not change from frame to frame. It also assumes that the SOP itself does not change from frame to frame, when of course it does. So I need to change this to set always, and that will ensure that even though this parameter isn't uh, 
changing, the SOP itself is re-imported at each frame. And the final thing that I need to do is to include this as set always, so that the bounding box, the dimensions of our scalar field, are also updated at every frame. And what we should now find, when we rewind the simulation and press play, and it will take a moment to calculate because all of these things are now falling onto the ground plane, is that our volume will move at every frame. And what I'm going to do is pause the video and allow that to simulate through. So that's done simulating. And the other thing I've done is in fact increase the value of this force here to 5000. I needed to do that in order to counteract the gravity which I've now added. And as we can see what happens is that as our mask moves across here these items are lifted up and then fall down behind as the force is no longer applied. And that's an effect uh, that's rather similar to the effect that uh, we created in the DOPS keyframes series of videos, but uh, rather simpler to achieve using a mask, uh, though not, of course, as easily controlled. So that's how to use a mask to control a force in DOPS. Well now, since we've used the drag force in the last example, let's go on and talk a bit about that. And I'm going to use a slightly different setup. Let's lay down a box and use the RBD object tool to make an RBD object. And then I'm going to go into the auto.network and I'm going to delete the gravity node. I'm also going to change my frame, frame range here so it's up to 100 frames. And I'm going to give my box object an initial velocity, and I can do that here on the initial state tab. And I'm going to give it a velocity in the negative z direction of minus 5. And if I press play, we can see that that object shoots off in the minus z direction, and that will keep on going forever because there is nothing to stop it moving. And this is the purpose of the drag force. The drag force acts on objects which are moving in order to retard their motion, in order to make them slow down. And it simulates the effect of things like air and wind resistance, which tends to prevent objects continuing to fly forever. So let's add a drag force node. And we can see here that there's a scale for the force. Now, I'm not going to ignore mass. I'm going to take mass into account. So I'm going to need a pretty high scale here. I'm going to go for 250. And what we should see is that with the drag applied, our box slows down and slows down and slows down and eventually comes to a halt. And what uh, the drag is doing is comparing the velocity of the object to the velocity we've specified here. And depending on how different those velocities are, it will apply this force. So if I was to give this the same velocity as our object is set up with, we should find that in fact it has no effect. Cube continues to go on forever. And that's because there is no difference between this velocity and the velocity of our cube, so no force is being applied you can use the same mechanism to reduce angular velocity by setting a value in here and setting the scale torque value. While we're on drag, a quick word about the sampling mode. And when you lay down any of the force nodes, the sampling mode will be set to default. And that means that it's set up to use whatever sampling mode is best for this particular type of force. And there are three basic sampling modes. There's a point sampling mode, a circle sampling mode, and a sphere sampling mode. The point mode 
uh, treats every object just as a single point. It doesn't examine the shape of the object. And it's very quick. And for quite a few of the forces, this is the default. The circle mode takes into account the surfaces of your object and applies the force accordingly. It's a bit more expensive to calculate and a bit more accurate for some types of force. The sphere mode takes into account the entire shape of the object and obviously it's the most accurate way of applying a force to an object but it can be extremely expensive to calculate so it's bef best left alone unless you really do need that level of accuracy. Well, let's now look at a force which combines the uniform force with the drag force, and that's called the wind force. So let's lay one down, put the display flag on it, and I'm going to make this point in the minus z direction. And I'm going to give it a scale of 200. And what this does is move the box and apply drag to it so that it will never go faster than a certain speed, in this case minus one unit per second in the z direction. If I make that sorry in the minus x in the minus z direction. If I make that minus ten, then we'll see that it speeds up until it gets to the speed of minus ten and we'll keep going on at that speed. And that is basically how wind works. A so wind would not be able to blow an object faster than the wind itself is traveling. There are, however, some oddities to this. Let me revert this back to minus one. And let me go back to our box object and give it an initial velocity of minus five in the z direction. So it starts traveling faster than the wind. And rather bizarrely, you can see it slows down until it's traveling at the direction, at the speed rather, given here in the wind force. Let's use this to demonstrate those sampling modes that I mentioned earlier on. I'm going to turn off this initial velocity. And the default sampling mode for the wind force is to use point sampling if I switch this to circle sampling, so it's going to take into account the surfaces that it's hitting, what we shall see is that the box starts spinning because the force is having a minutely different effect on different corners of the box. And we get a rather similar effect if we use the sphere sampling. except it's rather slower to work out. So that's the wind force. If you're watching carefully, you may have seen some variation in the movement of the box. And that's because by default, wind has some noise built into it. And we can see here that uh, this has a non-zero amplitude by default. So by default, there's a noise effect on the wind built in. That's enough of the wind force. Let's now have a look at the impulse force. And what an impulse force does is to give a specific impulse, a specific momentum to our object. So I could, for example, put in minus 5000 here, and that will give a an impulse of this amount at every time step, divided by the size of the time step. And often you'll want to animate the activation of this force. So in this case, I'm going to put dollar $SF, which is the simulation frame, equals 10. So this is going to be applied at frame 10. And we should find that at frame 10, our block starts moving with the specified momentum. Perhaps even more useful is the velocity impulse force. 
and what this does is apply sufficient force to an object over a single time step to give it the specified velocity. So let's set a velocity of minus 5 and I want to again animate the activation dollar sf equals 10 and what we should find now is that at frame 10 our box will start moving with a velocity of minus 5 along the z-axis. Well I've reverted back to our original setup to have a look at a couple of more complicated forces. The first one I'm going to look at is the fan force. And the fan force works in a radial form. Let me move this, grabbing the handle here, move this out. And I'm going to point it in the negative z direction. And we can see there's a cone-shaped object here which represents the cone angle of our fan. So we can change this, as so we can see that makes it narrower, and we can make it wider, and so on. I'm going to revert back to the defaults. And the effect of the cone object is limited over a set distance. By default that's 10, I'm going to increase it to 100, so that we have uh, plenty of effect. And I'm going to up the force per unit area to 1000 in order to make sure that our objects are properly affected. And if I play this, what we should see, you can see it here, is that the force is radiating out from a centre point here. So the force applied to the object depends on the angle here to the origin of our fan force. You'll have spotted too that when we apply the fan force, it appears to have less effect the further you are away from the source of the fan. And that's in fact correct, because there's a fall-off parameter here, which uh, determines how fast the force declines. I can increase this hugely, and we should find that only those items right close to the fan are immediately affected.